it's not water. You want to taste it? It's frozen. Yeah, it's ice in there. It's totally frozen. Well, we can dump out the salt water that we got All right. and fill it with that. And if it's fresh, we can boil it. Okay. We were preparing to make our exit from the abandoned border station with our fresh bounty of frozen mystery juice. When I decided to check one last door, which just so happened to be unlocked. Probably not something we should film. No, probably not. So we decided to poke around a bit. The fridge is empty. There's mattresses in here. Yeah, it works. The water works? No water. Nice. Despite the fact that the water tanks were empty. That's empty. There was presumably enough residual water in the lines to fill our bottles. And after drinking our fill, we made our exit. Let's get out of here before we get arrested. Before our luck ran out. We continued past the abandoned checkpoint, along the abandoned highway, and past road signs pointing to more abandoned places, until finally arriving at the pin on our map and our road into the void. Okay, so... This is where we meet, we leave the main road right here. Okay. Head up this valley. So, um, we're at 179.8. I'm gonna call it 180 kilometers, mm -hmm. which means that conservatively, we should have gas to get us 20 kilometers in. So we should- Unsure how far Volcancito de Troya was off the main road. Chad was sure to keep a keen eye on our trip meter to ensure we had enough fuel for the round trip. We could only afford to venture 20 kilometers into this barren alien landscape before we'd be forced to turn around and retrace our steps. This remote track, although well-worn, was rough in spots. Certainly not the toughest riding we've done, but everything at altitude is amplified. And while the altitude was great for our fuel consumption, the freezing temperatures were wreaking havoc on our GoPro batteries. So assuming we do actually make it to Troya, oh. you might just have to take our word for it. Little icy.
God damn. And although the Africa twin was plugging along, as we approached 4,300 meters, 14,000 feet above sea level, Chad was feeling the elevation. And just as the clock was running down on our fuel range, Whoa. we spotted El Volcancito just below us. We made the short descent to the ice-covered base of the baby volcano. Oh my god. <laughs> we f made it. Oh, this is wild. What is this? Is this all ice? It's all ice. And could barely contain our joy as we climbed to the top and peered deep into its bottomless blue waters. Oh, wow. This is amazing. This is incredible. Where are we? Oh, we're on Mars. <laughs> we are on Mars. I think the hypoxia is helping lead to the euphoria. <laughs> yeah. The lack of oxygen at altitude makes it seem that much more incredible. After ample drone selfies, and some hypoxia-fueled hijinks. Rose found more dead stuff, leave it to her. We took a moment to reflect. I am beyond stoked right now. I didn't know that I was gonna have enough gas or talent to actually make it here, but uh, apparently I had enough of both. We made it here with seven kilometers worth of gas to spare for the round trip, so I think we got enough for another night out here. The, uh, yeah, rations are gonna be a bit uh, slim. And I'm all out of beer, but you know, what are you gonna do? <laughs> I'm just way, way super stoked that we actually made it here. I didn't know that we were gonna be able to make it. So the, it, this is incredible out here. It's like being on Mars. It's indescribable. One of the coolest places I've ever been in my life, bar none. Now, all that was left. All right, now we just gotta make it back was to survive the ride back to the shelter. Whoa! Where our day would take a hard left turn from incredible to bizarre. After passing back through the yet still abandoned Pircas Negras border crossing, we hit the tarmac briefly before jumping on an unmarked dirt track to the shores of Laguna Brava and Refugio El Destapado. These stone shelters, dotting the barren expanse of both the Chilean and Argentinian Puna, were built in the mid to late 1800s. Home sweet home. To provide shelter to the muleteers who drove their livestock along the Camino de los Toros, or Path of the Bulls. Today, more commonly known 
as Highway 76. Not a whole lot to burn out here though. No. Does it have a trash fire? What's up my little Bedouin princess? <laughs> With temperatures dipping well below freezing at night, we elected to erect our tent to help retain what little heat we could and protect us from the refugio's other inhabitants. But as it turned out, we would be spending the night with more than just mice. Well, just when I thought today couldn't get much more interesting, I saw the cross there and I was like, huh, I wonder what all that's about. There's a human skeleton right here. Looks like uh, people donate cigarettes, there's a little bit of money down there. Didn't expect that. Guess we got company tonight. No grave robbing either, you leave that money alone. Rose, get out of the grave. Rose, I know you love touching dead things, but please get out of the grave. On a bid to find something to burn, Chad noticed a small metal cross wedged into the rocks beside the refugio. Upon closer inspection, Chad discovered the shelter's namesake resident. Little is known of this man. According to accounts, the remains are those of a Chilean who fled across the border as a fugitive from justice and froze to death inside this very shelter in 1964. The gauchos who would discover his remains were unable to dig a grave in the frozen earth and elected instead to construct a stone crypt for the man. And every time they returned, they would find the crypt open. Eventually, they resorted to filling the crypt with stones only to return to find the stones completely removed. From that day forward, the crypt was left unsealed and the anonymous Chilean man would be known as El Destapado, the Uncovered. negative eight degrees Celsius this morning, but at least the sun's finally rising, offering false promise of heat. But I'll even take false promise at this point. The next morning, we waited for the sun to rise and the coffee to kick in before packing up and jimmy rigging. Yeah, that won't do. Hey. We did pretty good on gas. We got, I was hoping to get about six liters per hundred kilometers, and we got about 6.5. I think I might be the first man in history to try to zip tie a brake rotor on a motorcycle. What is it they say? It ain't stupid if it works. Time will tell. <laughs> Doesn't move nearly as much, so we'll see how long it lasts. Might need to replace these eventually. Well, this is our highest camp so far, 14,200 feet. Not bad. Having maxed out our fuel range, the plan was to retrace our steps to the flatlands of the La Rioja province and the junction with Ruta 40. From there, we would head north and indulge in a bit of the tarmac twisties before heading back to the Andes to explore the remote passes and side roads of Highway 60, somewhere right about here.
it's warming up a bit, but I'm not complaining. I am. You are? <laughs> Starting to get a little hot? I have so many clothes on. Uh, you've always been hot, though. Whoa, burn. Uh, that wasn't really a burn, that was more of a compliment, but <laughs> I'm not used to complimenting people, so burn just comes out naturally. Burn! up and over the Cuesta de Miranda, where the Andean foothills meet the distinctive red rock that defines the La Rioja region. We descended into Chilecito for the night. After some laundry and a quick barfy party, we suited back up and jumped northbound on Highway 78 on our way back to the Altiplano. We pulled into Tino Gasta. Where's the cheese? Where's the cheese? We got chocolate. Oh, you've got some chocolate? Holy crap. It's real chocolate. Too. Wow. Look at them. Where's the cheese and chocolate? Stuff in the food bag. <laughs> I am the food bag. You are the food bag. <laughs> and loaded up with cheese, chocolate, some beer for Chad. <laughs> it's all your beer. Uh, is that what it is? There's only two cans in there. What's the rest of it? Mm and a delicious sandwich for me. Before hitting Highway 60 toward the famous Paso de San Francisco. At over 4,700 meters, 15,600 feet, this pass is one of the highest international border crossings in the world. And a popular pass for hardcore overlanders. But with nearly 500 kilometers between gas stops, most two-wheeled misfits stick to the highway, lacking the range to explore the many unmarked and unnamed roads around Laguna Negra, Laguna Verde, and Monte Pisces. The third tallest peak in South America and the second highest volcano in the world Departing the tarmac, we couldn't help but take notice of this sign, which we've conveniently translated in this public service announcement. Attention, Mr. Driver. From here on, mountain terrain conditions may vary in a non-predictable manner. You assume responsibility for the following risks. 
road with accumulation of snow, ice, and risk of avalanche. Severe white wind, loss of visibility, orientation, and temperatures below zero degrees, minus 10 degrees or more. Understand that mountain activities in winter, trekking and or expeditions that take place in areas far from large urban centers, medical, rescue, and other services can take several hours and even days due to the difficulty of access involved and or communications. Now, back to your regularly scheduled program. Despite the warning, we decided to tempt fate and proceed into the wilderness, where we came across another refugio. This shelter, complete with medical supplies, a backboard, fuel, and wood-burning stove, is reserved for emergencies. They're saying use only in case of emergency, so, I don't know, kind of gives me pause. So we elected to push on, unaware that tragedy was about to strike, and we're about to find ourselves in the midst of an emergency of our own. Mm -hmm. 